Okay, let's talk about muscle. Muscle in, their, in the horse uh, is made up of three types of muscle cells, the fast twitch, the slow twitch, and in between cells that are called fast twitch high oxidative. The fast twitch uh, are limited as to what type of fuel they can burn. They can burn glycogen, as can all three muscle fiber types, and they can burn creatine phosphate, which is a, a sprint fuel. You know, there's about 15 seconds of sprint fuel stored in uh, fast twitch muscles, and then when they run out of that, they, they go right to um, glycogen, muscle glycogen. The uh, slow twitch muscle cells uh, are oxidative muscle cells. They can burn other fuels, including uh, lactic acid, which is thrown off from the um, fast twitch muscle cells. The fast twitch muscle cells knock the top cup of carbons off the top of a glycogen molecule, and what's left over is lactic, well, pyruvate and lactic acid. And lactic acid goes out into the bloodstream, circulates next door to the uh, slow twitch muscle cells uh, that have oxidative capacity and those cells uh, burn lactic acid. So do the fast twitch ox high oxidative, which are in between muscle cells. They're uh, partially, they contract more quickly than slow twitch muscle cells and have more oxidative capacity than the fast twitch muscle cells. And they can burn lactic acid too. Now, to the extent that a muscle cell has oxidative capacity, to that extent, it contracts more slowly than uh, the outright fast twitch muscle cell. And muscle cells are plastic. They can mo be moved in one direction or the other, uh, depending on the uh, conditioning exposure the horse has uh, in, your, in your exercise regime. In other words, if you want more fast twitch muscle cells, uh, you can get them. Uh, you can move slow twitch up into the fast twitch high oxidative uh, with strenuous high intensity work. Uh, you can also deaden down the uh, fast twitch muscle cells by doing nothing but slow monotonous work all day long. You'll, you'll lose some of your fast twitch population. It'll drop down into the fast twitch high oxidative and some of the fast twitch high oxidative will move on down into the uh, slow twitch area. Now there's a, a misconception that has been around uh, since exercise physiology started, and it's now uh, no longer a misconception, but uh, in the horse world, uh, exercise science is a little bit behind. And so there are many people that still think that uh, when a horse goes, comes out of the starting gate, the first muscle cells to fire are the slow twitch, the next ones are the fast twitch oxidative, and the next ones are the fast twitch. Uh, because the horse runs out of oxygen and therefore those bad muscle cells have to take over their work, those bad muscle cells being the ones that produce lactic acid. Um, this isn't true at all. Uh, the truth is that uh, the brain and the spinal column request or recruit the type of muscle cell they want. And if you push the button for 110% effort, fast twitch muscle cells are going to fire from the instant the gun goes off. Uh, there's no running out of oxygen or anything like that. And in fact, uh, fast twitch muscle cells can continue to fire for uh, the most part of most thoroughbred uh, races and most standard bred races. Um, <clears throat> however, there is some uh, considerable part of the work that's going to be done by uh, fast twitch high oxidative muscle cells. And we want to develop those fast twitch high oxidative cells. The more, the more distance that we're going to take our horse, uh, the more those cells come in handy. Uh, for six furlongs in a thoroughbred race, it's almost all fast twitch. Uh, and for a quarter mile, it's all fast twitch. Uh, but for a mile, mile and a half, mile and a quarter, and same with standard breads, longer than a mile, uh, that FTH, fast twitch high oxidative uh, muscle cell, is going to come in very handy. And what makes it oxidative is that it has little bugs in it called mitochondria. Uh, these are uh, about the size of maybe a little bit bigger than bacteria cells, and they are living organisms that, that live symbiotically in uh, all mammalian bodies and they live on uh, lactic acid for one thing. That's the fuel they, they use to stay alive. 
so that when you do exercise that produces a lot of lactic acid, then these uh, mitochondria start to populate the area like flies on sugar. They start to come to that area. And the way you measure the oxidative capacity of a muscle, a group of muscles, is to look at the mitochondria density. How many mitochondria per square inch or per cubic inch? Uh, that tells you a lot about uh, how well the, the horse or the human can use uh, available oxygen because the mitochondria are the little factories that process the whole oxidative uh, uh, pathway uh, of energy burning. Without the mitochondria, you don't get uh, oxidative uh, uh, energy burning at all. Now, oxidative en energy uh, burning allows uh, not only lactic acid to be burned, but it also allows fat to be burned. So uh, in, uh, in a long race, like an endurance race, fat's going to be an important component of the energy supply. You don't want it to be the dominant component of the energy supply because then the horse will go slow. Fat is, a, it, fat is diesel. I've explained uh, this on another uh, uh, tape here, but uh, you don't want your muscle cells living on fat. You want them to be able to use fat as a secondary fuel to glycogen. Glycogen is the uh, first fuel, the most important fuel. So now uh, when a horse is uh, then uh, galloping down uh, at full speed down the racetrack and trying to win a, a race that goes in a minute and 10 seconds, uh, the muscle cells he's going to be using are primarily the uh, fast twitch muscle cells. And those muscle cells are going to throw off lactic acid. Now another misconception is that lactic acid uh, is what stops athletes from performing. In other words, you lift a weight more and more and more and pretty soon you get tired and pretty soon you just can't lift it anymore. That's it. That's all you've got. What's causing that to shut down? It's not lactic acid. That's something you should know. Lactic acid is not public enemy number one. Lactic acid is your friend. It becomes a fuel for the higher oxidative cells. Uh, this has been learned uh, uh, recently in human exercise science. It still hasn't got through the uh, uh, equine exercise science. Everybody graduated, I guess, before uh, these papers came out. But basically, lactic acid uh, is a beneficial uh, chemical. It's beneficial within the muscle as a buffer and without the muscle uh, as a fuel. Uh, don't worry about lactic acid. It's not, it's not a concern um, in terms of fatigue. Lactic acid is not what stops the horse. Muscle fuel depletion stops the horse. If the horse runs out of gas, in other words, if he run, he can have all the diesel in the world. He can have all the fat all over his body. It's completely useless to him. He'll never burn it in a minute and 10 seconds. It takes at least three minutes for fat to even start spinning up and becoming a viable fuel. Uh, but he'll rock and roll on straight muscle glycogen for as long as that muscle glycogen holds out and then uh, he'll stop, stop like he ran into a wall. And this running into the wall is uh, what you see with depleted glycogen, de depleted muscle glycogen. You don't want that to happen, so you won't always want to be pumping up the fuel of your engine. You always want that gasoline there ready to go, and you don't want the engine to suddenly have to shift over to diesel. Uh, because if it does, then uh, the whole performance goes down. Uh, it'll last, yeah, you, you've got, if you've got 20 pounds of fat, it'll take a long time to burn that fat, but uh, you won't go fast. You won't make any, any kind of serious speed. And that includes uh, endurance horses that aren't making real serious speed, but still have to go at a reasonable clip if they're gonna, if they're gonna do something, and fat is not the fuel to do that either. Fat helps, but the fuel to keep the horse Moving forward at a good clip is muscle glycogen and sometimes blood glucose. But by the time, if you run out of blood glucose or run out of muscle glycogen and you're starting to draw your blood glucose down, that's big trouble because shortly you're going to be in a crisis, a metabolic crisis is what they call it in endurance uh, riding, where the horse hits a wall and then it's a big wall and the horse can die right there uh, with this uh, low blood glucose. 
which is caused by muscle glycogen depletion, then followed by fuel drawdown in the blood itself, which is the glucose that keeps the brain and the uh, uh, nervous system alive. So you get into a shocky situation, you get into a crisis situation that uh, the body can't handle. Okay, I want to take you through a, a race, a thoroughbred race. Uh, Pop wing, Mick Canan goes on, and what's going on inside the horse? Canan just right successful now, in the Breeders' Cup turf with high chaparral. Rates that are varying from Long shot, perfect drift in post number five. Um, and here, the compact colt from California. They're uh, the ones that are misbehaving. Uh, will may have a heart rate, peak heart rates jumping around 150. Um, and that's not uh, significant, except that uh, they are experiencing a little uh, adrenaline pump. And so uh, that helps them uh, dump their spleen. And so they're going to come out in a, in a more warmed up condition, although none of these horses warmed up properly before the race. They, they never do. Well, some of the Brit, uh, some of the foreign guys do, but uh, in the U.S., uh, nobody warms up properly. Okay, now they're coming out of the gate. Uh, those that have misbehaved uh, have a higher percentage of their uh, red cells uh, uh, in the bloodstream right now, but not much. And it's going to take a full quarter mile for them to um, uh, get a full spleen dump uh, and have all their red cells available. So these guys are starting out right now without their backpack of endurance uh, going. Uh, and what that means is that they're going to build an oxygen debt much more quickly than uh, horses that were, that had been uh, properly warmed up. Now I want you to look at this horse on the uh, far uh, right of your screen, the number one horse. Uh, he's going to come out first. And I want you to look at his stride. Um, he's going to start out in a rotary gallop. And uh, let's just take a look at it. I'll move along here. Uh, now watch, his, uh, he comes out and his um, left hind is going to, or his right hind impacts first. Then uh, he's going to be on the left lead. Well, he's not going to be on the left lead, he's going to be in a rotary gallop. Watch. Okay, that was right left. And now his left leg impacts and then now his right. And so it goes right, left left right that's a rotary gallop here it comes again there's the right there's the left hinds and then the left four and the right four now look at the uh, left hind and the left four those two uh, in the rotary gallop want to interfere and you hear of a lot of horses stumbling as they come out of the starting gate legs want to interfere and the horse can come down on uh, that foreleg with the hind leg that's, that's coming forward and the foreleg is going backward. Uh, this is the only circumstance where a thoroughbred can interfere is when it's in a rotary gallop. And it occurs not only in the um, uh, coming out of the starting gate, but also in uh, one stride during every lead change. So you have to uh, be aware of that. Now look at the horse on the far left. Gallop. He's going to be going uh, right hind, left hind, right four, left four. And uh, that's, a, that's a normal gallop, but it's not as fast an accelerating gallop as the horse in the, in the one hole uh, is getting. Uh, a rotary gallop is an accelerating gallop. Uh, it's very effective that way. So, uh, but they can't maintain it too long because it uh, fatigues them. Okay, let's let them run for a little bit. Dubai got the jump at him, firing right off the mark. Came home on the outside, and Medallidoro comes on through. E Dubai is the leader as they race for the first turn. On the outside, Medallia Doro, and War Emblem is in between horses. He's running second now, and he'll go on to challenge E Dubai into the clubhouse turn. Perfect trip. Okay, now at this point, every horse in this race has uh, contracted its spleen and is now. Uh, their uh, body machinery, though, is still uh, in the process of warming up. They didn't warm up uh, during the post parade, and consequently, uh, their tendons and ligaments are still a little stiff. 
somewhere around the half mile, they're going to be as loose as they're going to get uh, for this race. Right now, they're still a little stiff, and they're ducking into the corner. Uh, they've all, they should have all changed to a left lead at this point. Uh, anyone that were on a right lead are over to the left at this point. And uh, you look at their jockeys, some of them are, are sitting high, some of them, some of them are sitting low. Uh, basically, that makes a hell of a difference. Uh, it's just like putting a sail up on a boat. Uh, if you're not close to the horse, uh, you're causing uh, some backward pressure on yourself, and, and that's uh, slowing your horse down to a certain extent. Uh, you know, when, when inches count in these, in these multi-million dollar races, one advantage that uh, the U.S. riders have over the European riders, the European riders tend to ride high and tend to be all over the place. Every motion of the rider uh, is uh, an extra job that the horse has to do. The rider should be perfectly still and low to the horse. Inside in fourth, Falpone rides the rails in fifth. Came home, is hustled up on the outside from sixth now. Mike Smith wants to get him close to his sixth length. Okay, now you've seen the first quarter in 23, and that's grade one distance time. In other words, these horses are going longer than a mile, but they're going out in a quarter mile in 23. Uh, sometimes it's 23 in a piece, seldom for a distance uh, race are they going to go out, go out faster than that. Now, a 23 second quarter most thoroughbreds can deliver if they were just delivering a single quarter uh, the problem and the difficulty is uh, maintaining that kind of speed uh, over a route of ground a mile mile and an eighth mile and a quarter mile and a half uh, no horse but secretariat has been able to main 20, maintain 20 maintain 24s all the way through a mile and a half so these horses are all going to slow down. Every last one of them is going to slow down at the finish, even though it looks like some are speeding up and accelerating past others. That's not what's happening. The, the others are slowing down, uh, slowing down more than the winners. <laughs> okay, let's watch some more. Dubai. Macho Uno is now running in mid-pack, and he's seventh. Harlan's Holiday is eighth, Milwaukee Brew is ninth. Hawkwing is... Okay, now somewhere in here before the half, uh, the horse has used up all of its sprint fuel. That's creatine phosphate, and that fuel uh, does not produce lactic acid. It's the firepower fuel. It's from fast twitch muscle cells. All of these horses are firing fast twitch or fast twitch high oxidative muscle cells right now. They're not firing any slow twitch muscle cells. Uh, their brain and their spinal column uh, are recruiting fast-firing muscle cells. Now, uh, the fast-firing, fast-twitch muscle cells are burning fuel. They all burned some creatine phosphate, okay? That's over with now. There's no more sprint fuel left. Uh, you can condition for it and pile it up and, and make sure there's plenty of it, but still, it never lasts more than 25 seconds. So now they're all into burning glycogen, and uh, half of their muscle cells that are firing right now are burning glycogen anaerobically uh, without the use of oxygen, and they're throwing off lactic acid. That lactic acid, if it's a, uh, in fact, even the, uh, the fast twitch high oxidative, they will also throw off lactic acid, but within themselves, they do have mitochondria, and that mitochondria will uh, allow some of that lactic acid to be burned oxidatively. Uh, the fast twitch, pure fast twitch muscle cells have to throw it off into the bloodstream. And so that's what's happening now the is these horses are burning glycogen. To the stretch runner evening attire. Now, if you if you wanted to find out how fast uh, a horse is going, uh, or let's say, let's say this, uh, you can look at stride length and stride turnover. Uh, stride length, you figure that every eighth pole is uh, 660 feet. Uh, the number of strides the horse takes between one eighth pole and the next. Uh, divide that by, uh, divide 660 by that number. In other words, if they take 14 strides or 22 strides or whatever it is, uh, divide that by into 660 feet and you'll know your horse's uh, stride length. Most of these horses are going to have stride lengths uh, between 22 and 24 feet. 
Uh, but stride length is not the key to winning races, thoroughbred races or quarter horse races. Stride turnover is the key to, uh, to winning uh, races. In other words, uh, how quickly can you recruit fast twitch muscle cells and how often can you make them fire and fire and fire and fire again? Now, there's a, there's a part of this that is determined by biomechanics, and I'll show you in a minute. Let's watch him race a little bit more. In 46 and 3 fifth seconds, and War Emblem is chasing him in earnest. He's under a hustling ride there by Espinosa. Okay, now notice that they've already slowed down a little bit. They're in 46 and 3. If they had continued 23s, uh, they would have been in 46 flat, but they're slowing down already. And they're going to hit 110 at the six furlong pole. Perfect drift is just coasting along in third. Medallia Doro fourth with five furlongs to go here. For the inside, Bob Pony bottled up in fifth. And then it's Harlan Taude, sixth as they approach the far turn. Macho Uno is moving up methodically on the inside. And came home is coming up empty. Hawkwing. All right, now uh, some of them are dying out. And the reason that some of them are dying out is because they're running out of gas. They're running out of muscle fuel. The reason horses slow down is because those fast twitch muscle cells which contain glycogen are being de depleted of that glycogen. And as they become depleted, uh, they have to, those, those individual cells stop firing and therefore there's less power. In other words, power comes from uh, how many muscle cells are recruited and actually do work at one split second worth of time. Power is going to come from more cells firing than less, but if you uh, deplete a muscle cell of fuel, uh, it won't, uh, even though it's you're trying to trigger it, it won't be triggered and uh, it will not fire. So consequently, uh, uh, fewer and fewer muscle cells are available as these horses go around the track. If, if, if these were human athletes, they'd be better fueled, but still, uh, no athlete can maintain 100% firepower for uh, very long. In a circle, horses on the far outside, Hawkwings in gear. So too is Milwaukee Brew, arounding the far turn, and the Derby winners in front. War Emblem has taken over, but Medallia Doro is right there in his throat latch, and Volcone. Okay, now let's talk about strides for a minute. Stride rate the frequency of the stride is what uh, is going to win races. And one of the things that uh, makes for a slow stride is those forefeet uh, shod with low angles, long toes, and toe grabs. That keeps the front foot on the ground for longer than you want it to be on the ground and slows the whole break over the front. When the front doesn't break over, the hind cannot reach up and grab ground. And that's what the hind are doing right here. The hinds are reaching up and grabbing a piece of ground once the forelegs get out of the way. Watch the inside horse there. Now watch, the hind legs come up and grab the ground. The forelegs just basically roll over. They're just almost straight up and down by the time they hit. Okay, now let's let these guys roll for a minute. As the field turns for home, Bob Pony on the inside has taken over. The lead okay, now we have um, horses. The two front horses right now are on uh, leads. That means the left four is hitting last and it's a diagonal stride. Watch the first horse. The outside leg is hitting. There's the inside leg, then the outside foreleg, and then the inside foreleg. Okay, let's, let's let them move down the track a little bit. Again, the four horse is left hind, uh, right hind, left hind, right four, left four. And in fact, the second place horse is doing the same thing right now. They're both in uh, left leads and it's a regular diagonal gallop. Right hind, left hind, right front, left front. Now these strides are taking about 0.55 seconds per stride and half the stride is in the air. So there's not much foot contact uh, to these strides at all. There's just a, a microseconds uh, that these these legs are actually touching the ground and those hind legs are reaching up and throwing the horse forward 
the forelegs or keeping the horse's nose from hitting the ground. Now watch this. Uh, the horse, let's just back up and see what he just did. Okay, now here we go, forward again, and watch. Right hind, he's, he's on the right lead, but his hind legs are not on the hind lead. Now the horse behind him is still on the inside lead, is still on the left lead. Now watch, here he goes. Now watch, he'll ch have changed his whole stride, and he will be in a full diagonal gallop on the right lead instead of the left lead. Now he's left hind, the next foot to hit the ground is right hind, the next foot to hit, hit the ground is left fore, and then right fore. Now the horse behind him is still in a diagonal gallop uh, to the inside, to the left uh, left lead. Let's watch out and see how long it takes him to get, a, get it over with. And there he goes, he's outside, inside inside there hit now he's starting his lead change okay he just went from outside to inside left to um, right to left and then he's doing a left now so right now and then watch when he comes up this next couple of strides okay now why right there is where the hind leg wants to touch that fore leg that left fore um, but it doesn't and he's going on and uh, now he's in a diagonal gallop as well to the outside or to the right. Uh, so he's on his right lead. Okay, let's watch him go ahead and finish the race here. Our emblem is spent. And farther back, it is Milwaukee Brew, who's now third, followed by Macho Uno fourth. They're coming down to the finish, and it's going to be a huge upset. 40 to 1. Talk about what is an upset. Uh, 40 to 1 horse. What we're talking about it's just a few seconds, a couple of seconds difference on whatever distance this is. Uh, a thoroughbred that races uh, a mile and 137 is a $30,000 claimer at best uh, if he does a consistent 137 mile. But a thoroughbred who races a mile and 133 is Breeders' Cup material. Uh, and can win a Breeders' Cup in 135. If he has 133 capability, he's a, he's a multi-million dollar winner as well as being a multi-million dollar breeding stock later on. So the difference between these horses right now is minuscule. There's not much difference. And we can make this difference up just by glycogen loading. We uh, feed these horses uh, four days coming up to a race. We feed them extra glycogen producing uh, sugars and chromium and get that uh, extra muscle uh, fuel stuck away in the muscles and those horses that are back uh, wouldn't be back they wouldn't be slowing down like they are uh, if they had glycogen loaded. they'd be up there competing with this horse uh, and this horse would be, of course be even faster if he had uh, been loaded uh, glycogen loading prevents the horses from slowing down at the end of a race that's the whole purpose of it but right now, all three of these horses are suffering from severe glycogen depletion. Their strides all have slowed up. Uh, the front horse's stride has slowed up uh, less than the other two, but all of their strides have slowed, and they're going much slower than when they were running that first quarter. He scores in the class His horses that have crossed the finish line uh, as they crossed the finish line, their heart rates were hitting uh, 240, 238, maybe 233, maybe as low as 222. Uh, and now their, uh, their hearts will uh, start to relax and they'll uh, go back. And if you wanted to, actually, unfortunately, the, the, the racing officials thinks, think a heart rate monitor is an electrical device and they won't ever let you uh, wear a heart rate monitor on the in a race, uh, they'll let you wear cameras, but they won't let you wear a heart rate monitor. Uh, and you should, because you should know how fast your horse is recovering from a given, uh, this is the ultimate in exertion. Uh, you should be able to wear a heart rate monitor and find out how your horse is recovering, how high the heart rate revved during that race. Uh, all the things you really need to know, but you can't know because of um, <laughs> rules and regulations that uh, are from the 16th century. Medallion Doro 
finishing in second with the photo finish there with Milwaukee Brew, Valpone, and Jose Santos. Now, the fact that a 40 to 1 uh, horse wins the Breeders' Cup uh, should tell you something. And what it, what it does tell you is that uh, nobody knows, including the trainers, including the riders, nobody knows what today's horse is going to deliver. Uh, you have a pretty good hint. You know, if you've, if you've got a horse that has uh, delivered 107s uh, every, every workout of his life, then you know he's a pretty damn fast horse and it's going to take a hell of a horse to beat him. Uh, but nobody knows uh, exercise physiology uh, who's training these horses and consequently they can't predict a lot of these horses are running at this distance for the first time. Uh, in the Kentucky Derby certainly they're running a mile and a quarter for the very first time they ever saw uh, that distance. It'll be in the Kentucky Derby and that's unfortunate because you can't predict anything you can't you can't you know you're you're driving a million dollar machine and you don't know whether you're going to run out of gas or not so uh, that's your typical thoroughbred race uh, these horses all of them not missing one of them have been galloping about a mile and a half a day maybe exotically two miles a day uh, once every five days they're uh, they're doing a, a breeze that might last a minute uh, sometimes it won't last a minute uh, and the rest of the days they're doing slow work um, but to the tune of a mile and a half and uh, these are completely unfit uh, horses uh, a mile and a half is about five minutes worth of exercise a day so that's what you can expect uh, from uh, five minutes worth of exercise you can expect no world records breaking Everybody trains the same way you know if somebody trained different that would be a whole different ball game but everybody on the tra racetrack trains the same way they look at see what D Wayne Lucas does and they do that um, sometimes they don't do what D Wayne Lucas does because uh, uh, Lucas breaks down a few horses so you know he puts he gives speed specific work to him which is good uh, but it does you know with an unprepared horse it does uh, cripple them and some of them can't afford to cripple horses so they'll breathe slower than D Wayne but then they won't compete in the Breeders Cup because they they're just working at a lower level uh, basically your hain your trainer your horse is a creature of his trainers habits so anyway, that's what a that's what a thoroughbred race looks like. Uh, these horses are coming down now. This horse's heart rate's probably down at 180 Johnson. right now. Pony was trying to find his way throughout the year on the turf. Well, should he go long? Should he trying go short? to find himself. Hey, Nobody knows what he Johnson. can do. And this again is one for the old school. Here All right, he nice is shot of the these horses coming through the, the uh, turn. You see him coming the turn. through there on the rail, taking over from more emblem and Dalyador. Nice movers, though. You know, the, the nice thing about thoroughbred racing is it's a gorgeous sport. The, the horses themselves are just wonderful to watch move. You know, that's, that's what you call the element in neuromuscular coordination. You've got four legs that are uh, cycling uh, billions of quints to produce this uh, galloping stride, which takes a half a second for the whole stride, include, including air time. Uh, and uh, those four legs are experiencing, uh, right now that horse is experiencing about 10,000 pounds per stride on those four legs. And uh, that's a lot of uh, weight to bear. And if he was experiencing 18,000 pounds, then one of his four legs would break. And that happens enough so that we, you know, have to be aware of that. Anyway, that's what a thoroughbred race looks like. Another component of uh, building equine athletes is the sports medicine side. And by sports medicine, mainly we're talking about um, uh, injuries, avoiding them, diagnosing them when they do occur, and then healing them. Now, one of the big problems in the uh, equine game is that uh, nobody wants to diagnose a lameness. The horse can't talk to you. So you're stuck with actually having to diagnose. And it costs money to diagnose. You have to have x-rays, you have to have ultrasound sector scans, sometimes you have to have scintigraphy done. You know, you really have to search around until you find uh, the location that, uh, that is the problem. 
Now there are some new technologies coming on. I'll, I'll be describing some of them later on, but uh, one of them is infrared thermography where you can s actually see uh, where the lesion is under the skin for uh, uh, injuries that are below the knee or at the knee and from the hocks on down. Uh, you can see injuries in the feet, you can see them in the ankles, the knees, the hocks. Uh, sometimes you can see them in the stifles. Uh, you can see them along the backbone. Uh, you can't see deep into the shoulders or the hips uh, with this type of a device. It sees, uh, it's measuring surface temperatures and uh, the surface temperature over an area that is inflamed uh, and building repair process in it is going to be hotter than nearby tissues and that's basically the way it uh, says hey doc point your uh, x-ray machine right here or your uh, infra, uh, your ultrasound sector scanner right here because that's where the problem is and that simplifies things quite a lot uh, especially because you can see um, injuries coming on uh, at this point I'm so reliant on the on the device that I can't even uh, consider training a horse without uh, having having one available because it keeps me from causing the injuries that um, uh, are very difficult to heal once the, once they're there. Okay, I want to show you another type of uh, technology that we use uh, very successfully uh, with all performance horses, and it's called uh, infrared thermography. You know, right now you can't see what this horse's legs are uh, telling you in terms of what kind of injury he's got, but now we can see uh, with the infrared camera, and we're this is a casual scanning tape, just video recorded directly to uh, video, so it's a little bit uh, chaotic. But you can see right away, you can clearly see that this horse has got a left front tendon uh, giving him a problem. And that's what this is for, is it sees hot spots uh, from the knees on down and the hocks on down. All of the organs that uh, have a problem uh, are very close to the surface. So if there's a repair process going on and a lot of extra circulation in the area, then uh, it'll show up on this camera as uh, heat. And that's what we're seeing. This, this camera sees heat. Notice that the coronary bands of the feet are the hottest uh, parts of the horse, uh, or of the lower legs. Uh, you get up higher and you'll see a bow there. That shouldn't be there. It shouldn't be as hot as the uh, coronary bands. And so this is a very uh, uh, useful uh, device when you're training horses. You, there's the hocks. A lot of race horses have uh, low joint hocks no matter what else they've got. This horse does not. So he's in good shape that way. Uh, but it, in terms of training and the use of this uh, device, you know, from day to day, you can see uh, what you've injured, what you haven't injured, injuries coming on or injuries going away. If you already knew that the injury was there, uh, then you can watch it go away. It'll see everything uh, from joint injuries to tendons, ligaments, suspensory foot problems, it'll see feet problems all the way around. And so it's a real good tool for predicting that you're going to have a, a lame horse if you keep on doing what you're doing. And sometimes what you're doing is shoeing wrong. Sometimes what you're doing is exercising too fast too soon. Uh, there's a lot of things you can be doing wrong, but you better quit it if you start seeing tendons like this. This is a pair of tendons, dispensary uh, going on. So this horse is feeling the effects of um, either bad training or bad shoeing or uh, whatever is causing it. We better eliminate the cause right now or we're going to get into, into very big trouble. <clears throat> this is also good if you're, uh, you know, you're bidding on a horse at a sale and, and you want to know whether uh, he's got... Uh, clean legs or not, uh, this thing will see from 20, 25 feet away. Uh, we're about five feet away here. Um, and you can actually buy telephoto lenses for them if you get real serious. You can buy telephoto lenses for these cameras. They're not cheap. The one I'm using right here is uh, a Fleur E-Systems camera um, that uh, sells for 12500 and the le extra lenses sell for about 3500 so they're not, they're not cheap. But uh, believe me, if you have one horse in your barn 
worth twelve thousand five hundred dollars. Uh, you can see the problems two weeks to three weeks, sometimes a month before they actually become a critical uh, problem. Now we're looking up in the body of the horse and the shoulders and the neck. Trying to see if we see any hot spots. Generally, you're not going to be able to see into the shoulder or into the hip. Uh, it won't see that far. It'll see uh, abscesses in the tooth, though, uh, but it won't see deep. Um, it's looking at surface temperatures. And where there's something unusual on the surface, then underlying it is generally an inflammatory process. You look on, along the backbone of the horse, you'll see uh, heat at the places where the back is being pinched by the saddle or by the rider. It'll see stifles. That one had a stifle. Um, and foot problems uh, is really the big thing that this uh, starts to see right away, as you can see where your foot is unbalanced. Um, some feet uh, that are uh, cut low and, and long uh, will have heat at the heel. These feet here have just a little bit of heat at the heel. Uh, but bad. Now this, this horse does have uh, uh, low joint hocks both sides. This is a new horse that we're looking at. And um, you know the feet you can see that they're imbalanced. The long parts of the feet have uh, uh, bleed down of heat into the foot. Uh, from the coronary band. Again, tendons. Here's a tendon just screaming at you. And if you looked at that tendon, you wouldn't know that there, there was a tendon there. Uh, these are good looking feet here from the front. But anyway, that's infrared thermography. It's a good technology. Uh, I use it on all of our horses. Uh, Anybody that's in the business seriously should have one of these cameras. It's not that expensive. Uh, you know, you, you rub the cartilage out between bones and uh, you're stuck with a horse that's going to have a, a joint problem forever. It's not going to ever get better. You can help it get better a little bit with hyaluronic acid, with uh, uh, joint powders and things like this, but in general the damage is done and as time goes on uh, that joint will experience more and more arthritic changes, more and more bony changes, uh, more and more scar tissue formation, uh, and at some point it's not going to be an athlete anymore. So you don't want to do this damage, uh, severe damage, uh, on the horse at all. Uh, so you want to see it coming, and you can see when things are starting to get irritated in the joints with the infrared thermography. Right now they've got handheld cameras, you can just walk out and in five minutes you can look at an entire horse and say, okay, go ahead, take them to the track. Uh, used to be, it would be a $40,000 camera on a tripod that you'd have to walk the horse through and around, and um, kind of an involved process. Sometimes you had to put dry ice in the, in the camera to keep the detector cool. Uh, other times you would put uh, argon gas through it uh, to keep the detector cool. Now all of that's done electri electronically. So, you know, the first job is to prevent uh, injuries from happening. And you can do this uh, with shoeing. If you know they're coming, then you've got to make changes. And uh, some of those changes are going to be in shoeing. Um, some of them are going to be in supportive nutrition. Believe it or not, if you don't support the horse with good nutrition, uh, then all the connective tissues get weaker and weaker and weaker. They get weaker and weaker with Lasix. If you're racing a horse on Lasix every week or every two weeks, uh, you're bound to get a tendon or a suspensory somewhere down the line because those tissues are weakening uh, gradually, a little bit at a time. Uh, but eventually you're going to have a problem with the horse because uh, that Lasix is blowing out all of the uh, uh, minerals that you've so carefully put into the horse uh, on the way to uh, building, building your athlete. Now, one of the problems though in the horse game is that nobody wants to diagnose. Uh, the vets don't want to diagnose. They don't get paid for diagnosing. Uh, you never heard a guy uh, say, hey, uh, instead of $100 for this needle, it'll be $100 for me to look at this horse. Uh, it doesn't work that way. What they do is they get paid for treating the horse. And so therefore they'll treat before they'll diagnose, more often times than not. 
And that's like you go, you're taking your car to the garage and you say, look, uh, something's wrong. The battery keeps going dead on this thing. I think there's a short in there someplace. Uh, find it. And the guy uh, you know, calls you on Monday and says, your, your car's ready. You go in and get it. And hell, three hours later, you've got the same dead battery. You bring it back. He said, well, I'll uh, leave it here. And he re each time you do it, he replaces something. But uh, it doesn't get fixed until about the fourth thing is replaced. And that's the same way vets are doing things at the racetrack, at least, these days, is that they uh, treat before they know what the hell they're treating. <clears throat> and of course, the trainers avoid the vet as much as possible and try to do their own doctoring. Uh, and then sometimes they'll bring in acupuncture people and uh, touchy-feely people that haven't the foggiest idea what diagnostics all, is all about, but go ahead and discover something and start treating it. Uh, and of course that is a, a waste of time and money because uh, for the most part they don't, they don't treat a thing. Um, and a horse with an injury needs medical attention. It doesn't need uh, witch doctor attention. But uh, you know, you can't. Uh, there's no use trying to convince anybody of this. Uh, I'm, I'm think I'm speaking to some intelligent people because if you know my name, you know that uh, I'm real uh, intolerant of stupidity. And so you wouldn't even be buying my videos if uh, if you thought that uh, you were stupid. Um, <laughs> So I figure I'm, I'm speaking to somebody reasonably intelligent because you don't want to be insulted by anybody. And I, I will happily uh, insult any, um, any witch doctor I encounter. And some of them are veterinarians. Uh, and uh, you know how difficult it is to get a veterinarian to bother to take the x-ray machine out of the back of his truck. Uh, Believe me, I've had so many fistfights with vets who just are too damn lazy to bring out the equipment that does the diagnostic. They'd rather do their little dance. Right, spin him this way. Okay, now spin him that way. Okay, let me hold his leg up. Now let me, now run him. Okay. I mean, that's 16th century dentistry that they're practicing there. Um, it has nothing to do with diagnostics. So what you really want to do is uh, when you know you have a problem you don't want to stop diagnosing until you know what that problem is and if you don't know for certain what that problem is then it's always up for grabs uh, uh, you can start you can start eliminating possibilities you know if you've got sore muscles uh, you might think, well, maybe this horse is tying up. Uh, if so, then pull the blood and see. And if he's got high muscle enzymes, hey, the possibility uh, just went up uh, about 100%. So, uh, you know, you can make guesses and uh, then test for them. Uh, sometimes testing for something like EPM, you know, uh, so you, a horse looks like he's got the wobbles, okay, with, e, with EPM. And uh, sometimes the test is the medication, and in this case it probably is because you can do a test and you'll have more horses test positive that aren't, uh, uh, that are not affected by EPM. They've been exposed to it but are not, uh, don't have the, the parasites alive and doing them uh, problems. The best way to test for EPM is just to go ahead and give the medicine um, and save yourself the 600 bucks that it takes to get a spinal tap analyzed. Um, just go ahead and give the medicine. If it improves, <laughs> that, that's what it was. Um, and don't be afraid to do those things. If, if you have uh, no other way to diagnose, go ahead. For example, diagnostics in the vet, some of the best diagnostics is uh, injecting and blocking a certain area and then injecting a little higher and blocking that area and injecting a little higher and blocking that area until you find at least the level, you know, the leg that it's in and the level of the leg. It's, it's from the ankle on down, or it's from the foot on down, or it's from the knee on down. Uh, and if you've already blocked out the foot and the ankle, and then you, uh, you still got a lame horse and you block the knee, well, then it's, it's between the knee and, it, and the horse walks fine, then it's between the knee and the ankle, okay? That can be splint, it could be knee, it could be cannon bone, shin, shin bucks, or a fracture. You know, uh, and all of these things can be blocked out as a test for what is right and what is wrong uh, 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 about that leg. Again, the infrared, though, gets you right to the place. It says, oh, right over here, uh, Doc, uh, take a picture of that. You know, your job as an owner uh, is to insist 
that you know what is wrong with the horse. If, if there is something wrong, then, and you need to know that there is something wrong, and sometimes that's covered up uh, as well. With, uh, the occasional corticosteroid injection makes that leg, leg look real pretty in the morning when you show up to see the horse uh, move, and the horse doesn't feel a damn thing with the, with the uh, corticosteroid in the joint. So he feels pretty good and everything looks fine. You walk away and a week later you get a, a telephone call saying, now we had to scratch, he's a little bit off in his right front. Well, uh, again, all I can say to the owner of a racehorse is that it's your job, your absolute responsibility to take care of your own investment. Nobody else gives a damn about it but you. And uh, one of the first things you have to do is know what the diagnostics are for everything that can happen to your horse and get them done early if you can. Uh, prevent injuries if you can. And again, I, you know, every owner that uh, these little handheld cameras are $12,500. Hey, if you've got a horse that's worth $12,500, you need one of those cameras uh, because they'll tell you right away before the horse gets seriously injured that Two weeks from now, this horse is going to bow that left front tendon. That's what it says. That's how good it is. And um, you need to know how to, how to do this thing. And you can do it yourself. You can carry it around in your back pocket almost and pull it out and look at your horse's legs. The guy says, uh, what are you looking at? And you say, it's none of your damn business. And uh, let him worry about his business and you can worry about your business. Uh, that's the way I'd play it, you know, but I'm a kind of, kind of a nasty fellow. I don't uh, put up with too much bullshit. You might want to put up with more than I will, but uh, I've been at this 30 years now and uh, I don't want to put up with it anymore. And the same thing goes with endurance horses. I mean, talk about witch, witches at work. Uh, that's the place where you see a lot of it going on. They've all got these massage people and ear tweakers and all of the uh, communication people and all that. That's, they flock around those endurance people because uh, they're mostly uh, casual people. Uh, people that uh, if they weren't riding a horse would be uh, mowing the lawn. You know, it's not the horses. Uh, not expensive. It's not a re typically. It's not a real valuable animal, uh, so it doesn't deserve any more care than, uh, let's say, the the second uh, car of the family. And so, when something goes wrong, they look to uh, save a, a couple dollars by having a witch come in instead of uh, having a vet come in to take a look. Um, the, you know, fine, but those people, you know. Those are the ones we're out to beat. Those are the ones that uh, make winning fun. Um, you know, for every loser, we, uh, for every winner, we have to have 10 losers. And I'm, I'm real glad to have those people out there, but not you and not me. Uh, we've got to know, and we've got to be serious about this, or, or there's no use playing. You know, the, the, the games are for, uh, for winning. Uh, they're not for being there, they're for winning. And a lot of the philosophy of uh, American endurance, why one of the reasons why American endurance horses don't win any place anymore is that uh, uh, the whole philosophy here is, has turned screaming liberal. There, you know, everybody can win. Everybody wins. You go out and you show up, and you've already automatically won. Or if you actually finish a race, you'll kill a horse. Many of them will kill a horse trying to finish a race. I mean. A horse that doesn't even belong in a hundred mile, or they go out and, and walk it a hundred miles, and it falls over dead. Uh, but they do it because they want to have finished, because that's success. Doesn't mean they have to finish first or anything. They can bring a, a fat pig of a horse in with no feet uh, and <laughs> barefoot, and uh, drag him around a hundred miles and think they're successful. Uh, I don't. Uh, I think uh, that you you get into sport uh, to be as good as you can you can be, and um, make your athlete as good as he can be. So you condition the daylights out of them. But it, as you do it, uh, you have to protect your investment. And believe me, uh, my time is valuable. I don't know what your time is worth, but my time is valuable. I don't want to spend time six months on a horse. All, just to, within a five second period of time, cripple them for life. You know, 
it doesn't make economic sense. It just, it's not logical, it's not reasonable to do that. And uh, now for some it's very reasonable. Oh, gee, uh, he went lame on me. Well, what do you mean? He, you went lame on him, you weren't watching. Um, you can see uh, almost every injury that occurs on a horse is cumulative. Uh, a bowed tendon is cumulative. It started two months ago and it's been coming on, coming on. A fracture started a while back and it's been coming on, coming on. Very seldom do you have a horse take a real serious misstep and snap a leg off. Instead, something has weakened the area prior to this catastrophic injury and uh, with the whole leg letting go or, or with just a bow or just a cracked sesamoid or a uh, fractured cannon bone uh, or a chipped knee, these things are visible months, months before they happen with thermography. Okay, uh, this time I'll, we want to count the strides that this horse is uh, taking for an eighth of a mile. Let's just see what we get. Uh, we'll let him go and then we'll slow it down right here. And shortly we'll come up on a pole. And there it is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 26 strides. I'm going to stop it right here a second. 26 strides into 660 feet. 660 oh, divided by 26 is a 25.38 stride length for that individual horse. Okay, now here's a quarter horse race. And we're going to do it in slow motion. Just want to give you an idea how these horses come out of the gate. They're like water bugs. Uh, look at the horse coming out of the five. He gets squashed by the six. And then the, ho the horse in the four is going over it. He's knocking everybody to the inside of him. Banging into him. Now here he comes. He's going to get smashed by the horse out of the five. Meanwhile, the guy that's got uh, th free running is the guy in the uh, red silks, who I guess was the six or the seven, I'm not sure, but he's right down the middle of the track. Everybody else is every which way. That's a typical quarter horse race. And in fact, this is an expensive uh, quarter horse race. I think this is a million dollar race here. Quarter horses, uh, tend to uh, have a faster stride turnover than do thoroughbreds um, and much faster than do Arabians. Uh, they also tend to come out of the gate with a rotary gallop and maintain that rotary gallop for uh, a good piece. We'll show you that rotary on one of these here in a minute. A lot harder to pass other horses uh, when you're when everybody else is going fast. Uh, you don't see much in the way of um, uh, position changing here, except for traffic. When they get into traffic, that's one thing. But you know, once you once they get rolling, everybody kind of stays the same until toward the end. Uh, some of the horses run out of gas, and when they run out of gas, they slow down, and the others uh, pass them. It's a lot easier to pass horses when they're going slow than it is to pass horses when they're going fast. That's why uh, in a thoroughbred race, uh, you let the, uh, the speed horse get out there in front and let him just beat up 
himself with another speed horse and then later on in the race they're going to be going slow and your horse may not have speed but uh, if he's got any kind of speed whatsoever he can pass a horse that is walking to the uh, to the finish line. Now quarter horses aren't trained hardly at all. They, uh, they might go out every other day uh, to the racetrack and do some exercise. Um, and when they do it, they generally don't do uh, a full mile of uh, gallop around the track. Uh, they'll go three quarters of a mile, they'll go a little bit. They're afraid that they'll slow the horse down with mileage. And uh, if they did a lot of slow mileage, yes, they would slow the horse down because uh, <clears throat> basically you get what you're trained for. <clears throat> and if you don't have um, uh, a lot of volume going into speed work, then uh, when you go back and try to uh, train uh, uh, for speed, uh, if that's just a small part of your exercise game plan, then you don't... Uh, you're training the horse to go slow rather than fast for the most part but again uh, not much more than uh, once every five days do they go out and do a screaming piece of work all right now let's watch these horses come out of the gate notice that the one on the right here with the red uh, outfit uh, he's in a rotary gallop uh, right left left right here is the right hand hind, left hind, left four, right four. That's a rotary, and coming up is the place where they want to come to. Right there is where they would hit each other if uh, the shoeing's not right or the horse isn't balanced right or whatever the reason. That's where they'd bang each other, the two legs. Still in the rotary gallop still in the rotary gallop. Still in the rotary gallop. Well, this is about six or seven strides. Still in the rotary gallop. Back him up a little bit. I think he might have just changed strides there. Outside, inside. Inside, outside. Inside, outside. Inside, outside. Okay, now right there was his lead change. And so he didn't have to take two strides to get into a diagonal gallop. He was already in a rotary uh, right lead. Now one of the things that uh, that thoroughbred guys think is if you get the horse skinny as you can get him, he's going to have more speed. Uh, that's not true. These horses are fast, are fat, a lot of firepower, a lot of muscle there, and uh, actually these horses can uh, can stay too if they were going a little bit slower. Now here's a, a patch, a group of uh, Arabian race horses. I want you to look at the splits on this, on these horses. They look like they're uh, doing what a thoroughbred does and what a quarter horse does, but they're smaller horses and they're going a lot slower. Uh, Arabian race horses, though, are trained just like uh, thoroughbreds and quarter horses are, and which is not much training at all. You know, again maybe a mile and a half a day of slow work and then once every five there's a quarter and 25.72 um, and the these horses are going their top speed so 25.72 is about two and a half seconds slower than a, th a thoroughbred on a quarter and when they take it all the way out to six furlongs that two and a half second deficit per quarter is going to be the same note that uh, you've got one horse way in front of the others this is typical of uh, Arabian racing in that um, there aren't many Arabians racing and consequently it's hard to for a, uh, a track supervisor to uh, 
get a group of Arabians and a horse that all have the same uh, uh, racing capabilities. Now this horse is in what? Left hind, right hind, left four, right four. Okay, he's uh, he's in the diagonal gallop out of the turn. The gates are the same for uh, thoroughbreds, quarter horses, and uh, Arabian, and any other horse that's galloping in a in an event, whether it's an endurance horse or a, uh, a flat racer. Their gates are all the same. Half mile in 52.69, pretty slow half mile. That would be a, a typical workout half mile, a slow workout half mile for a thoroughbred. This is a racing five furlongs in 107. That's slow for a thoroughbred, but for an Arab, it's not too bad. One twenty-two for six furlongs. This is Los Alamitos. You uh, you see a lot of uh, quarter horses and uh, Arabs and thoroughbreds racing together again because it's hard to fill uh, a card at a cheaper track. There's a horse that's getting warmed up. Um, this happens quite a bit now. What happens to this horse is he's going down the track. And unfortunately, in this case, they're not going to pick him up soon enough, and so he'll be scratched. But a horse that gets away like this and then gets caught by the red coats and brought back uh, generally has an advantage because uh, he's dumped his spleen. Once you diagnose uh, and you know what you're dealing with, then you've got to figure out ways to uh, heal uh, the injuries. Um, with buck shins and splints, Basically, there's no way to put sauces on them and, and make them uh, heal fast. They will heal uh, on their own in about 35 to 40 days of active um, recovery. So if you're moving the horse every day, just move him easy uh, so he doesn't nod. If he's nodding, then you have to wait until he stops nodding uh, before you start putting him under saddle. Uh, and then just gradually bring them back uh, and don't do any speed or any hard work until that, uh, that splint or the buck shins have uh, gone away. And they will go away on their own within 35 days, or in about 35 days for the most part. Um, bowed tendons, uh, there's something interesting about bowed tendons. I wrote a book called The Bowed Tendon Book, and basically it was uh, a book that uh, T taught how to avoid bowed tendons because basically you're, you're looking at 12 to 16 months of healing and then you don't know if the tendon's healed or not. You go out and try them and damn if he doesn't bow up again. Uh, what we found out about this, and by accident, some fellow called me up, a uh, doctor out of uh, California called me up and said, you should have had the uh, answer in that book. And I said, there's no answer. You've got to sit there and wait for the damn thing to heal. And he said, no, you don't. Uh, here's how you uh, treat him. And uh, he had been successfully treating bowed horses that he was buying cheap off Bay Meadows racetrack and then bringing them back to Bay Meadows sound uh, and ready to go five months later. And here's what he was doing. Uh, because tendons respond to the number of contractions they experience and not to the strength of the contractions, but just to the number of, uh, he was putting, uh, uh, muscle stimulators on the deep and superficial flexor muscle up, up high above the knee, not high above the knee, but right above the knee, uh, and causing uh, those muscles to contract. And when they contracted, they would contract the whole sus suspensory apparatus all the way down to the foot. You could, if you lifted the foot off the ground, you could see it doing this, and it would contract about twice a second. Well, if you just then you just wrap this little uh, box on the horse's leg. Uh, and leave it there for four hours a day, and uh, the horse really doesn't feel it. Uh, uh, goes on eating his, out of his hay rack and, and behaving himself, and uh, you do that uh, every day. Um, and then what happens is that the, the swelling and edema gets pumped out quickly. 
um, within seven to ten days, that's gone. Then you go back onto the, onto the horse. You saddle them up and you start walking them, and then you start trotting them, and then you start loping them, and uh, you just rebuild over a five-month period. You just rebuild the fitness of that horse, uh, uh, hopefully going from long and slow works to shorter, faster, shorter, faster, shorter, faster, so that at each stage uh, the tendon is experiencing a little bit more stretch, a little bit more. You know, if there's some scar tissue there or some adhesions, that they'll break down, they'll blow up a little bit, it'll stop you, it, it'll back you up a little bit. Uh, it's give and take sometimes, uh, especially if you've let it go for a while and there is scar tissue there. But basically what happens is that within five months you've got a brand new tendon and you go out and race and, and don't worry about that leg, you worry about the other leg that hasn't been treated because if you've got the same uh, situation that caused the, the first bow, you'll get another one uh, and it'll probably be on the other leg because this, this one's pretty strong right now. Uh, that's the other thing. When you, as you're uh, healing the injury, you're also eliminating the cause, and you've got to think long and hard about what the cause is. Uh, uh, we've talked about shoeing, but again, the long toe, low heel shoeing, that's a lot of the cause of all the soft tissue injuries that occur in the front leg behind the cannon bone, the tendons, the suspensory, uh, sesamoid problems, uh, sometimes knee chips, sometimes ankle chips. Uh, a lot of that stuff comes from real bad shoeing, low angles, toe grabs, that kind of stuff. Uh, some of it comes from uh, bad uh, training surfaces. You know, uh, you don't take a $100,000 horse and train him uh, on a half mile bull ring. Uh, uh, you can do that with standard breads if the, if the track is uh, banked, but if the track isn't banked, you can't even do it with standard breads. Um, because you'll hurt them and you know uh, it may not be a hundred thousand dollar horse you've got but I'll tell you what by the time you get through this horse you'll have a hundred thousand dollars worth of time effort blood sweat and tears plus feeding and upkeep and the cost of the horse to start with so it's a serious investment whether it's time or it's cash dollars um, so make sure you're training on a surface that accommodates the kind of exercise that you have to do. Even with endurance, uh, even though uh, endurance horses are going to have to go over rocky terrain and climb, climb vertical hills, uh, you don't want to be doing a lot of practice like that. That might be something you do on a day off, just get some agility into the horse. But on your uh, real conditioning days, you better have a surface that's reasonably kind because you're going to be doing an awful lot of work and you don't want something that uh, every 15 steps the horse steps on a stone and it goes up into his soul and uh, then you've got a bruise to deal with for the next week. Then you don't get anything done. It's the same with buck shins. You don't want to cause buck shins and you do cause them uh, because if you cause buck shins then all the time you've put in up to the time that you've got the buck shins is wasted because you've got to take uh, two or three, you know, a month or two or turn a horse out or whatever, the, you know, <laughs> fire them, uh, blister them. You do all those things and that makes you turn them out for a while. And so you, lo you lose the fitness that you've built. Uh, unnecessarily because you can avoid buck shins entirely and the way to avoid, avoid buck shins is not to do speed all of a sudden, not to bring the horse to speed quickly. Take just Peel the speed off the horse like you're peeling an onion. Slice by slice by slice you're taking away more seconds off that mile time, then later more seconds off that three-quarter time, then later more seconds off that five-eighths time, long and slow to short and fast. Don't go short and fast and try to stagger into longer uh, exercises. It's just the absolute wrong way to go. Some, sometimes I think that if you go to the racetrack and you do things precisely the opposite of what everybody else is doing, you're gonna, you'll beat the daylights out of them because they're doing almost everything wrong. Uh, <laughs> and if you're, if you're a track guy, you know, if you've bought this tape, you've got to be intelligent. You've got to know that they're doing things wrong. You've got to know that if you're doing the same things they are, that you're doing them wrong. Um, that's just the truth. Now, if your owner has given you this tape <laughs> to have you, hey, listen to this crazy guy. Uh, he's got some real good ideas, and you get this videotape, and you're watching me tell you that you don't know what the hell you're doing. Uh, 
Um, that can be aggravating. I know it can be aggravating. Um, I've had people tell me that I don't know what, I, what the hell I'm doing. So, you know, and there were times when, <laughs> when I didn't know uh, what the hell I was doing. I mean, every expert has to make 3,000 mistakes. If you haven't made your 3,000 mistakes, you're not an expert. I don't care. Uh, uh, mistakes teach you. Uh, doing everything right the first go doesn't teach you a damn thing. You just blunder into that. Uh, getting a top racehorse all of a sudden dropped on your head, that doesn't make you a horseman. Uh, all the, you know, anybody, can, anybody can take a top horse uh, that, that can't be hurt, no matter what the hell you do to them, and uh, it can go faster than secretariat. Well, hey, uh, you know, your game is made, and if you do that, then you're going to have 100 owners knocking on your door with uh, 300 horses uh, for you to train. You're made. Good. Okay. See you later. Uh, you don't need me. I'm talking to the guys that have to work for a living and uh, haven't got lucky yet. And I'm talking to guys who want to make their luck happen because, in general, luck does uh, get made. It's, it, it, luck isn't born for the most part. <laughs> and racehorses aren't born. Uh, racehorses are made. Believe it or not, they are. You know, the way, the way it's done at the racetrack, uh, yeah, pedigree really counts because there's no training being done or, or what training there is being done, it's being done all the same way. So that variable is static. And so the only variable that there is is pedigree. That goes up and down. Uh, there's a little bit of vet care over here, but that variable also is the same with everybody. They all stick needles into them every chance they get. So the, the, the playing field is even that way. Now, if you do something different in training, you upset the play, uh, playing field, especially if you do it right. Then you bring yourself to this level, and maybe your pedigree is here, but your training is here, and that brings your horse up to here. And that could be a 135 mile. Uh, you know, there's, uh, in a thoroughbred, there's, uh, there's four seconds difference between uh, a $30,000 horse and a $30 million horse, uh, 137 to 134. 136 to 133, that's three seconds, you know. 132, if you got a consistent 132 horse, hey, you got the world by the tail. And I'm telling you that human athletes every year improve that much uh, every season. From the beginning of the season to the end of the season, they improve that much. And that's because they're spending four hours to six hours a day, every day, exercising and doing the right kind of scientific exercise because all of their teachers, all of their coaches, all of their trainers are trained in exercise science. And, you know, that counts. It's, uh, it's what this game is about. It, it, we're, we're dealing with athletes. Uh, you can't get around that. We're not dealing with unicorns. We're not dealing with uh, horses that come in flying on uh, wings and sit down next to us and talk to us. Uh, the, uh, Mr. Ed doesn't exist. Okay, We're dealing with blood and flesh and bone. And it operates just like my blood and flesh and bone. It operates just like your dog's blood, flesh and bone. You know, it's all the same stuff. And uh, in humans, we know how it really works for athletics. Um, all you have to do is read some human uh, exercise books, and you'll start to understand that, boy, these people really know what they're talking about. And it, if you understand that all of that same stuff applies to your horse, then you'll get the picture. It's a big picture. It's a, a wonderful big picture of opportunity for somebody who, who does have the brain power and the will and the courage to do something different than every other guy on the shed row is doing. It takes courage to do that.